Good. We're back live. Uh, now, this is Senate Judiciary, Tuesday, February, Thursday, February 11th, 2021. We're taking up S-18, an act relating to earn time. Uh, Eric, do you want to share the screen and go over the, the highlighted changes? Sure. In draft 2.1, dated 210-21. 5.24 p.m. Yep, sounds good. <clears throat> this is uh, Eric Fitzpatrick with the Office of Legislative Counsel. As Senator Sears said, it here to go over the uh, committee amendment to S-18, the re revised committee amendment, I should say. Uh, we have the, um, the uh, first version that you'd already looked at uh, I think it was yesterday. And uh, the version we're gonna look at today is a revised amendment based on the committee discussions that took place yesterday, as well as some uh, back and forth that I then had with some of the witnesses on the proposed changes. So the first one will, I'm just gonna pull it up here real quick. So here we are. Um, can everyone see that? Yes. Yep. Thank you. Okay, great. Sure. So this is, uh, as Senator Sears said, version 2.1 of the committee strike all amendment. Uh, you'll see the first section has to do with the topic of <clears throat> providing notice to the victim. Remember that because the sort of big picture concept of what's going on here is that the uh, prospective portion of the bill that was in the in the version as introduced, in other words, it applied to uh, uh, offenders going forward who had committed a disqualifying offense has been struck from the bill, but that was sort of done with the understanding that the notice to victims would be beefed up so that uh, going forward, uh, it would uh, be a situation where victims would have noticed that uh, the application of earn time, as it's going to be called, uh, could potentially affect how much time uh, the defendant serves. So you'll see that language is added to the statute that already provides information that is required to be disclosed to the victim by the prosecutor. And then it adds another piece, which you, the first part of it you looked at yesterday and that specifically says that as part of that series of information points that have to be disclosed, you add that you add to it that the victim is informed of the maximum amount of earn time that the defendant could accrue. And then there was an addition to that that was discussed yesterday uh, so in addition to notifying the victim about the amount of time, you also provide uh, notice that, that earned time only affects when a defendant is eligible for parole consideration, but does not necessarily result in the defendant's release. Uh, so I shared that language with uh, Sarah Robertson uh, at the network, and uh, she said they supported it. So uh, that's the concept that that's supposed to address. I think, Senator Sears, you would mentioned that yesterday, yeah. so that's, <clears throat> does that seem like it captures what you were hoping for it to get? For me, it's great. Uh, anybody else on the committee have? No, I think it's a good addition. Clarifies it. Thank you. Sure. So, uh, so that is the victim notification piece. Then we go into section two, which is the substance of the earned time program. Again, uh, the phrase good time is changed to earn time. So you see that that hasn't been changed, but that uh, is carried over from the previous draft. Mm -hmm. The list of uh, sort of groups of offenders who don't qualify for the <clears throat> earn time program is what you see in subdivision one there. And recall that what was added to that at the request of the Department of Corrections was offender sentenced to serve an interrupted sentence. Now, the definition of an interrupted sentence we'll see a bit further on because there's a definition section to this statute. And uh, I added that, that definition, which we'll get to in a moment. The second sentence you'll see just has some technical corrections. The first one, uh, Senator Baruth uh, pointed out yesterday had, was incorrectly phrased now because it's not going to be applying going forward anymore, this earn time. I should say the earn time program does, but the, the disqualifying offenses piece of it isn't going to be 
disqualifying anybody who's convicted after the effective date of the act. So in terms of what tends to be used there, it didn't make sense to be saying an offender who is convicted because it's only applying to defendants who have already been convicted and uh, already incarcerated at the time that the bill is passed. So that's changed from is to ch uh, the disqualifying offense only applies to offenders who have been convicted of a disqualifying offense or has been uh, in the sense of this sentence. So that's that first correction. And the second one, again, similar concept in that since the prospective piece of the bill is being struck, uh, that was all in subdivision six. So there's no, no reason to continue referring to subdivision six since it doesn't exist. So that's struck. And no changes here other than the continued ones that we saw on May changing the name. Question of the on, on, on page three, line yep. 11. And I'm rereading that. Um, that basically says, if after the adjudication, you would get um, earn time, um, but prior to sentencing, you wouldn't get it. If you're frequently, I know that um, defense attorneys will say, Joe needs drug treatment, he's willing to go um, to a program and they'll hold off sentencing until after Joe is finished with the treatment. That's basically saying that Joe doesn't get earn time during that period. But if after sentencing, he, he, he go, Joe goes to drug treatment, he would get earn time. Is that correct? Uh, it's definitely right for the post-sentencing universe that you're talking about, Senator Sears, the ones who, they, if they then go to treatment, they can get a one-for-one one day reduction for earned time. I'm not sure. You're probably, I, I, you know more than I do about the pre-adjudication group. Well, that's I, what I'm I, wondering. If, if somebody were to, assuming I'm the reporter of the bill, um, somebody asked me on the floor, is that what this means? I need uh, actually, I think I need DOC to or somebody to make sure that I've got it right. This is current law. Oh, it is. Okay. Yeah. This is current law. If you have a condition of release that orders you um, to to be in a, uh, a locked for you know a uh, treatment facility, then you get credit for time served against your sentence. Um, for the time that you have been held pre-trial in your in the uh, treatment facility, um, and the real question is, does your earned time because there ha wasn't earned time before, um, will the earned time apply to that? Um, typically, you only get earned time for the time that you've been sentenced to not for the credit that you've earned pre-conviction. Right. So somebody who's in jail or in treatment, I should say, before they're found, before they're sentenced, and before they're found guilty right. or innocent, obviously they're found innocent. It's not if they're found guilty, they would not receive earned time for that time and drug treatment spent in lieu of going, uh, being incarcerated. Correct, but they would get credit for time served. Yeah, right, right. but they wouldn't be eligible right. for. So I some, can also, oh, go ahead, sorry. Somebody who's uh, in jail, yeah, help me, Monica. Somebody that's in jail who has not been adjudicated is not eligible for earned time, is that correct? That's correct. You have to be a, a sentenced offender in order to receive earned time. Um, I can offer some clarification on this section around post-adjudication residential treatment, if, if you're interested in knowing, as, as the Defender General said, it's current law, so we're already implementing okay. that. All right. No, I'm fine with that. I just okay. needed to understand the <clears throat> all of that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. 
So before we go on to something else, I wonder if I could go back to page one. Sure. Um, so the sentence and inform the victim of the maximum amount of earned time that the defendant could accrue. Um, you know, if this is a, a victim who's there without a lot of support, I, I wonder if we could add and the earliest possible date of release so that somebody has something in mind, you know, that stays there six years down the road rather than then trying to figure out, oh, how do I calculate that again? If it, I think that would make it really clear and just say, and the earliest possible date of release. Well, uh, actually, I would say the earliest possible date of parole. Oh, yeah, okay. Eligibility. This is not necessarily released. We're trying to That's make clear that they wouldn't be released. Date of parole eligibility. Okay. I, I was just trying to scroll down on my screen here. <laughs> I couldn't do it. Um, yeah, right. <clears throat> But do can they? Is it is this at before sentencing that they're informed about that when they're making the plea agreement? And how would they know what the earliest date is if if there this is at or before the sentencing hearing? So if they wouldn't know what the they would know, I guess I'm confused about that. Eric, well, can you help me? Again, this is existing law, so I think I know, but. How could you? How could we tell them what the earliest date of their potential, if they haven't been sentenced yet? <clears throat> yeah, I think you can only tell them that they would they are, they're eligible for to serve nine years instead of the ten that were. If they do everything right, they'd serve eight years, six months, or something of that nature. Hmm. Yeah, it might be a good question for Matt and for Pepper as to far as, you know, what facts are known to them at that time and could could that be disclosed? I, you know, I, I don't know the answer, but um, well, one of the problems, but but Senator Danica has raised one of the problems that was in the earlier uh, iterations of good time before we ended it was that even lawyers and even some DOC personnel weren't sure what the release what the earliest possible role hearing would be. Neither was the judge. And nor was the judge. So I don't know that you could say what the release date is because you don't know what the day of sentencing was because this is all being done. But you could say that they're eligible for 365 days of earned time in this whatever period and go from there. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. <laughs> I think that's the idea behind this anyway. I mean, I mean, I'd like somebody to be able to know. Maybe, maybe um, there's a better way to do this, but I think this is not quite good enough for the victim to really know. Well, maybe, it, maybe we should, maybe um, I, 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 just, I can't see who's here. So if Sarah Robinson or Chris Benno or Matt Valerio or James Pepper wants to speak. To me, Matt, this, this is one of the easiest parts of this. Yeah. To be honest. I mean, in the old days, when, when I was dealing with uh, good time and, and uh, the client wants to know as well, when's the earliest time? You, you say, look, if you, uh, at, at that time, I would basically say to them, if you uh, earn all your good time, then you're going to get a third of your sentence reduced which is basically what it was at the time, 10 days for every 30. Um, and now it's, you know, you can literally put it on a chart and see if somebody's, uh, if somebody's sentence is X number of uh, years or, or months, um, then, uh, and they earn all of their good time, the earliest possible day that they're going to be able to do it, it be right there on the chart. It's not, it's not a, it's not a hard, this is an easy one. It probably yeah. should be passed out with victim information on every, with every uh, um, plea agreement. It's basically a week a month. And so yeah. in, in 12 months, you would get 12 weeks if you off, earned it all. Off their minimum? Off their minimum. Yeah, right? off their parole eligibility date. 
Can somebody out there with a computer make up the chart? <laughs> yeah, I think you do that, Senator. Yeah, this is James Pepper. I, I agree that this is a relatively easy calculation to do, and I don't think the victims advocates have any problem with being the one to deliver that information for the prosecutor's office. I do think that we would want some help from DOC to do an easy calculation, because if you look at the way the good time rule was uh, drafted, there are certain com complexities about, especially providing a specific date. Um, and we don't want, you know, bad information being passed to a victim, you know, because I think it's actually, instead of seven days for every month, I think it's actually seven days off the min and the max for every 30 days. And, and then there's fractional amounts for partial 30 days. So, you know, if you're serving between one and nine, if you're serving between one and nine days, then there's two days off. If you're serving between nine and 15 days, then there's five days off. There's some, some complexities to this system that I wouldn't feel comfortable having our victims advocates try and calculate the very specific date. And, and then you get into the idea, you know, if it's, seven days for every 30 days. And then some, some years have leap years that, you know, might impact that. If there was an easy calculator that DOC could provide, I think the victims advocates could certainly provide the maximum amount of time potentially accrued, but uh, we would need some help in the actual calculation. I mean, is this the kind of thing where they have to know the ex very exact possible day that they might be eligible for um, or is it the kind of thing that, you know, within a five day or 10 day window, uh, you know, they, they're going to need to know I, it's, uh, there are these nuances, uh, that, but, you know, even when lawyers are explaining this to their clients, you know, they're not giving them an exact day. They're giving them a <laughs> ballpark that gets you within a week of what it would be, no matter, no matter what it's the prisoner's rights office. You know, when you've been in jail for some period of time, a few days extra is not just a few days extra. It means something to you. Um, and, you know, they end up arguing about those kind of things. But, you know, you're, you're always within a, you know, five to 10 day window um, in the, uh, of eligibility. I mean, I don't, I don't know that an exact date is the important thing, but maybe it is. I don't know. Yeah, I, I think that would be overly cumbersome. Go ahead. Chris? That's Monica. Oh, oh sorry, Monica. Chris. You can. I don't want to jump say... ahead. If Chris wants to go, I'll wait. Okay. I don't think the. I. I. I don't. I think anybody who was given an exact date, there's all kinds of things that can happen. So I think I would think that the important thing is that they understand how it's calculated. They're going to be getting, uh, if they want, they're going to be getting notification of how much is being earned, and then hopefully advocates will be able to help them because they can call the advocate years later and uh, have a conversation about what this all means. But I think, you know, lots of things can happen. The compassionate release, you know, you don't want to give people a date because I don't think it's realistic to think, especially for longer sentences, that that's going to be the day they get out or the day they get paroled. Yeah. I agree. If I could just add, Senator. Yeah, Monica. Um, yes, please. Thank, thank you. Um, I, it's interesting. Uh, uh, Defender General mentioned a chart because that was something that had occurred to me as well. Um, I, I do think it it would be really valuable for the victims advocates at the state's attorney's office to have something that that's easy to show, like in the best case circumstance, this is um, how much would come off someone's minimum and maximum sentence, um, and and show people. And I think that you know we could work together to do that. What I what I would want to avoid was having every sentence have to be calculated twice by our sentence comp unit um, in yep. order to give people an exact date. So I think we can work something like that out because the calculation is fairly straightforward. And then, um, in, and as um, we've all said, just being in, in the range just to show um, mm. is probably good enough. And our victims advocates will also are also going to be available. And there's also more information that we're going to be putting making available to people um, about someone's release date. And, and that will be available, that is available publicly now and will continue to be available. 
publicly. Thank you. Okay, Senator Nitka. Uh, I'm, I'm okay if it's even within the month, but I think to, uh, does everybody have a victim's advocate? Aren't, are there not some people who don't? People that weren't a victim or people who don't want to have them. Victims, does every victim who's out there that you know of have be um, taken care of by the victim's advocate's office? Uh, this Just is Chris Benno. What I would say to that is that it, at one point they had access to a victim advocate. They may not in, in the real time, but that's where the corrections advocates could step in and, um, and be able to explain things. But I do know that there are advocates uh, in the state's attorney's office who talk periodically to people years after um, the, the person has been incarcerated. Okay, thanks. So is that you comfortable moving on from here, Senator Nitka? Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. Senator. That's okay. <laughs> so it'll have to be. I'm Sounds good. Thank you. So, so I'm sort of I'm hearing that I think for now this language is okay as is. Yep. It seems okay. Um, so that was as we as we said that was a, a discussion that all relative to victim notification. Now mm -hmm. we're back into the substance of the earn time program itself. We went through these technical corrections just now. Uh, move further down to uh, the substance of the program, and again this is for offenders who are serving a sentence at the time that this goes into effect. So it's only applies to that universe of offenders, folks who are serving a sentence at the time and it has to be for a disqualifying offense. And if you are serving a sentence for a disqualifying offense at the time this uh, bill is passed and signed, then going forward, that person doesn't earn any further earned time. Uh, they would still have the right to keep any earned time that they had earned uh, up until the effective date of the act, but they wouldn't get, uh, earn any additional amounts going forward. So the, as the committee was discussing, that means obviously the, the crucial point in defining that universe is what is a disqualifying offense. And you'll see voluntary manslaughter is highlighted uh, because the committee wanted to look at that again. Uh, I don't think it still said that you have two subdivision Bs there just because I, I don't think a final decision had been made, but you wanted to at least look at it again and think about it. Um, yep. So uh, the ones you have agreed on, I think, are murder, kidnapping, L and L with a child, with the age gap exception that we discussed, yep. sexual assault, aggravated sexual assault, and aggravated sexual assault of a child. Um, the voluntary manslaughter one, I think, is still on the table for discussion. Um, I might, even before we get to that, since we see it right now, and I already mentioned the interrupted sentence piece, I'll, I'll just point you to that language as well. You see it highlighted on page five. Mm -hmm. Again, this is a carve out for uh, folks to whom the earned time program does not apply. We have a, a, several groups of people who don't earn good time under the existing law, including life without parole uh, sentences and a couple of others. And uh, at DOC's request, they wanted to add interrupted sentence to that list of folks that, who wouldn't earn good time. And I worked with uh, Monica emailing language back and forth a few times, and this is where it, it settled out. So the definition, remember the committee wanted a little more clarity in the definition. Actually, there wasn't a definition in the first draft, but wanted a definition of the term. And so the language you see is that it means a sentence that is not served continuously, including a sentence to be served in intervals, which is uh, means refers to a weekend sentence because it's an interval, you're there for the weekend, but then you're not there during the week, or a sentence to the work group, which is also not continuous because you're only there during the work day. Uh, and those are, that uses the term including. In other words, it's not, a, not an exhaustive list. There could be other uh, uh, types of sentences that would meet the definition, but now you have language in the bill that clarifies what an interrupted sentence means. Okay, I'm okay. <clears throat> Looks good. Mm -hmm. 
And I sorry. think, oh, sorry, go ahead, Senator Sears. No, 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 go ahead. No, but I was just uh, going to say that the, that you also have the uh, compassionate release section is still in here, but I know that was also something the committee was right. discussing. And uh, if you wanted to see the um, the existing language that I think Monica had mentioned on release and Senator Sears, you'd refer to it as well. That the, there is some existing language in statute for when pers a person I think has a terminal illness. Mm -hmm. um, I think we can, should be able to pull up here. Um, let's see. Yeah, oh, you're we. working with your, <laughs> I just did a wipe. I was trying to run your screen. I did oh. the same thing. <laughs> it's your oh, screen, sorry, not yeah. mine. <laughs> okay, so thank I was, you. I was doing it from my end. <laughs> it's weird. I have my little mouse over here. Moving it around. <laughs> Moving your yeah. thing around, it wasn't working. <laughs> what, wasn't, wasn't having any effect? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, just so, so you can take a look at the language, you see the, uh, it's, I believe the reference was to subsection D here of uh, 502A, when uh, an inmate um, has a terminal or serious medical condition that renders the inmate unlikely to be physical capable of presenting a danger, they may be released on medical parole to hospital, high, uh, hospice, other licensed inpatient facility, other suitable housing accommodation recommended, or spe sorry, specified by the parole board. Um, so then there's some sort of accompanying requirements to go along in it with it, but that is the, uh, the big picture of that group of people that can qualify for release on the basis of their medical condition. Yeah. yeah the, um, Sorry, did you want to stick with Eric. Um, Yep. There so doesn't I think have that, to be an age under that. Correct. Correct. It could be somebody 45 years old could have just been sentenced. Mm -hmm. well. Yep. So I think that brings us to the end of the walkthrough of the new draft. Uh, still, obviously, a couple of right. things to discuss, this compassionate release and the manslaughter piece, but or any, any other points that you want to discuss, too, obviously. I think, I think we're down to compassionate release and manslaughter. Voluntary manslaughter. Um, where are those definitions? Uh, we've got them. I've got them on a thing I printed out, but Eric provided it to us. Maybe can yeah. you um, put up the definition of um, the manslaughter that you had? You printed. You did for us, Eric. It's yes, ledge I mean, three five three one thirty three v one. That helps. Thank you. Yeah, let me try and pull that up. The voluntary manslaughter is an intentional, unlawful killing of another human being committed under sudden passion or great provo provocation. Uh oh. Oh, my wife just fell. I got to go help her. Can you oh, take dear. over, Senator White? No, Senator Baruch. Uh, yeah, sure. whoever. Um, voluntary manslaughter is an intentional, unlawful killing of another human being committed under sudden passion or great provocation that would mitigate but not justify the killing. Sudden passion or great provocation can reduce a charge of murder to a charge of voluntary manslaughter. And in the discussion, last time it seemed that one of the worries was that a more serious crime would get pled down to this um, and so in effect we would be allowing earned time to someone who had committed a more egregious crime than this um, but for various reasons got pled down. Um, so I'm trying to remember where the committee was on this I have to say, I'm not personally um, 
against re-including this, even though we, we straw voted to pull it out before because of the testimony from uh, the attorney general's office and other things, I could, I could uh, vote for keeping it in the disqualifying offenses. Um, Alice, I see you nodded. So I, I'm wanting to have voluntary um, included as, as being excluded. Yeah. <laughs> and are, are you uh, saying then that you would be okay with continuing to have involuntary, um, not one of the disqualifying offenses? Not crazy about it, but yes. Okay. Jeanette, wh where are you on that? Um, <laughs> it, it's hard for me to say because I have issues with the entire bill. Yeah, yeah, understood. Senator Benning. Well, certainly involuntary manslaughter um, shouldn't be one of the disqualifiers. I'm, I'm looking at voluntary manslaughter and saying to myself, there's in my head a reason why somebody should be able to get the um, credit. And Alice, while I understand your concern, all that this really does is require the state's attorney to have a conversation prior to entry into a plea agreement um, to make sure that the victims understand that that's part and parcel of the process. So I don't know why we would have this um, on the list because there are situations that it's not pled down, that it was a straight up charge of voluntary manslaughter. And there's, there's an element of um, passion and provocation that society in general understands you got to pay for something here, but it doesn't rise to the level of a higher murder charge. And the only thing that we are going to be doing by um, allowing credit <clears throat> if this section is removed is it says to the state's attorney, they've got to be able to have a good conversation with the victim's family in that situation um, in order for them to understand what would be happening in the event of a plea agreement. And the, the prosecutor doesn't have to agree to the plea offer. Um, so it puts in my head a little equilibrium to the discussion. Not sure that's the right word, but frankly, I'm torn for words these days. That's all. Senator Sears, we, uh, we were just each weighing in on it. Oh, okay. Um, so, uh, I'm fine with adding having it in as one of the disqualifying uh, crimes. I think that's three three votes to re add it in. That is voluntary manslaughter, which means to exclude them from. Yes. <clears throat> right. It's three to two. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, me, and Alice are okay with putting it back in. Good. All right. Um, let's move to. Is there any other sticking point other than um, the compassionate release? Well, I, I just wanted to say I still agree with Senator White on this piece. I think she's right. <clears throat> um, I can't support it without some language regarding the debilitating disease or something of that nature. I'm, I'm worried about a lot of things about this. Um, well, Dick, for whatever it's worth, I'm going to agree with you. Um, 
I suspect this provision contained in this bill is going to be a poison pill going over to the other side. It uh, will no. be. They took it out last time. And, yeah. Uh, I've already been told that they won't accept it. Okay. Um, what I can agree to do is look at this in the miscellaneous bill, looking at that section of law that Eric just showed us. Um, and making sure that there's some provision here. We've seen it during COVID, by the way, people who are, um, there's been an attempt by the Department of Corrections and some prosecutors and obviously defense bar <coughs> to get people out who are a heightened danger to, um, this is nationwide, not just in Vermont, yeah. um, to not have people incarcerated who might um, succumb to COVID. Um, but on the other hand, I've got, keep in mind this guy from Florida who's been avoiding a sentence for, um, or a trial for um, a lewd act with a child. Um, he was actually from New York State and was over in the Stratton area, I believe. And uh, he'd been avoided by claiming his heart condition couldn't stand a trial, but they have pictures of him down in Florida getting on a boat and doing all kinds of stuff. And this has been going on for at least two decades, if not longer. <clears throat> so, um, but I, I know where you're coming from, Senator White. Um, but I think um, I would uh, be more than willing to look at something we could do to improve the current law regarding compassionate release. I'm, I'm happy to have it done someplace else. Okay. So Eric, could you, um, you and Senator White and myself maybe get some time offline to discuss something in the miscellaneous bill that would improve upon the current law regarding compassion. I, I'm going to call it, um, what do they call that law? I think it was medical release. But medical, to, to revisit medical release. Sure. That sounds good. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Um, so we would take that out and uh, Everything else stays in as presented in draft 2.1. Eric, yep. can you just there a motion to, to the uh, qual uh, disqualifying? E yeah, we. Um, oh. So it sort of starts right there. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. <laughs> that sounds good. So you got two Bs you'll have to in draft. Would it be draft 3.1, Eric? Yes, exactly. So in draft 3.1, it would be A. Uh, <clears throat> it, you'd have another. You'd have to renumber. Yes, thank you. Yep. <clears throat> and is that the only change from and would take out the compassionate release? Is that the only change from current? Yep, from the current version, that's it. As far as based on the discussion that the committee just had, I, those are those are the only two, I think. Okay. I'm in the <clears throat> process of making them right now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, is there a motion to report favorably draft 3.1 or actually to, to yeah, Senator Peru. So moved. Senator Bruth has moved that we report that we amend S18 as seen in version 3.1, which we just discussed and Eric is preparing right now. Is there any further discussion? Um, Senator is, White. Is this the appropriate time for me to say what I have to say? Yep. Okay. Well, either now or when we vote on the bill. Okay, I'll wait. 
Okay. Uh, Senator Bruth has moved. Peggy, would you please call the roll on amending the bill? I'm doing, oh, second. Oh, uh, yeah. Thank Senator, you, Senator. Senator Benning? Yes. Senator Nika? Yes. Senator White? Yes. Senator Bruth? Yes. Senator Sears? Yes. Okay, we've now amended the bill. <clears throat> Is there a motion to report draft 3.1 favorably? Senator I'll White. Wait. No, I'll wait till the motion is made. Make a motion that we, we report it favorably. Senator Nick has moved that we report version 3.1 of the bill as amended 18. Is there any further discussion? Senator White. Yes, I, I have to say that um, I have great sympathy for the victims for the the necessity, the potential necessity for them to relive um, the crimes done to them um, earlier and potentially more often than um, they would if if we didn't pass this. But this does. Well, I have to remember that this doesn't guarantee release, only the ability for a hearing. And I do uh, sympathize with them that they would have to go through that hearing process. But I do also trust the parole board to make decisions um, taking in mind the types of crimes. And by um, doing this, what we've done is we've, we've uh, eliminated all kinds of cases it just we've eliminated categories of crimes as opposed to um, the individuals within those. And there's a great disparity within each of those categories of crime, I believe, around the, the individuals within those categories. So um, I, I think that it creates two classes of victims, those who absolutely knew and those who will be slightly unsure, even though they've been um, informed of that and two classes of prisoners. Somebody who is, um, doesn't get earned time because of a, a particular crime and somebody who does get earned time because of a particular crime. We also this morning heard from Sarah George that uh, some state's attorneys use old records which could in fact um, influence the current sentencing and so I believe that it would, and we know that state's attorneys um, prosecute in many different ways. We have 14 of them. And I believe that this would um, exacerbate the inequality of justice around the state. So while I really honor the committee's process and the give and take and the, everybody's willingness to compromise here, and I really want to vote to support that process, I can't support this bill for those reasons. Any other comments? I'm appreciative of your view, Senator White. Um, this is a difficult bill because it's difficult to admit you made a mistake. Um, and I think Unfortunately, uh, the victims um, were eloquent and spoke uh, here. And I, it was the testimony of them and some others that I heard from <clears throat> that led me to support this bill. When, I, um, when we first got notice and I looked back at what we had done in 2020 um, in advancing this bill, uh, I remember uh, a email from Chris Fenno, representing the Center for Crime Victim Services, indicating support but concern about how victims were notified, how would victims know that this change had taken place. At the time we did this, I don't remember anyone raising an objection to that. Um, there were Everybody was involved, the state's attorneys, the attorney general, uh, the victims groups, other than the network. I don't believe the network was involved. 
um, sometime in October or November, I had conversations with the Attorney General um, about what once the victims had been notified by the Department of Corrections, and I agreed to sponsor the bill. I am actually very glad that the committee chose to move prospectively, allowing earned time for everyone. I think that was an important statement because, <clears throat> but if you're gonna change the rules of the ball game, you, you usually don't do it in the middle of the game. And then fortunately um, for some of those victims, they had made agreements during a plea bargain um, with the prosecutor um, to a certain um, sentence. And um, we changed that sentence without fully understanding the impact on the court. So you know, it's tough for me as a politician to admit a mistake, um, but just as the attorney general said when he uh, was here in the first witness of the bill that he made a mistake. And that's tough for somebody who's a statewide uh, elected official to do. And I, I respect him for that, uh, which is the reason that I agreed to sponsor the bill, the reason I'm supporting the bill now. But I do wanna say I, I respect Senator White, your voice in opposition to this. I'm going to vote yes. Anybody else who would like to speak at this time? <clears throat> Peggy, would you please call the roll? Senator Benning. Yes. Senator Nicka. Yes. Senator White. No. Senator Baruth. Yes. Senator Sears. Yes. Um, I'll Happy to report the bill once Eric's got it drafted and we go through this process of during COVID getting the information to the secretary. Senator Nick. Then um, Eric, once you have the final version, could you give that to Peggy so she can get it to us, please? Yep. yep. Yeah, sure. Yep. He'll give it it's to me. It. Oops, sorry. I was just saying that it still has to be proofed by our editors, so uh, it may not be till tomorrow morning, but sometime today or tomorrow, I'll, I'll send it to Peggy and then she can post it. Okay, or can you actually send it to us, Peggy? Please. I, I can send it to you guys and I'll give it to Senator Sears who will send it up to the Senate Secretary's office with the vote. Um, I'm also supposed to alert the Secretary's office that the bill will be coming. Um, so I will let them know to expect it either later today or tomorrow morning, correct? Okay. I think real, realistically, we'd have to say tomorrow, Peggy. Okay, that's fine. Yeah, I think Thank you. Um, I actually would prefer to be reporting it um, <clears throat> not next Tuesday. I think at least we should have a caucus to discuss and, the, and both parties may wish to discuss it in the caucus. Okay. So Senator Sears, does that mean that You'd be comfortable. So if if, the, if it did go to if the it clerk comes up tomorrow. if it comes up tomorrow and it got to the clerk tomorrow, I'm fine with that because then it would go on notice for a yep. vote on Wednesday, be on notice on Tuesday. Perfect. So take your time. Thank you. Well, I know. I know. So, so I'll tell them most likely tomorrow morning. Then correct. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, tomorrow. I don't know if it'd be in the morning. Tomorrow, yeah. <laughs> Depends on the editors. I don't know how backed up the editors are either. All right. Um, why don't we take a one minute and 30 second break? You don't have to shut things down, Peggy. Just, okay. We're going to take a brief break to uh, transfer over to Bryn and a different bill, S45, which is the probation bill. Thanks, Eric, for all the work on this. Appreciate it. You bet. Thank you. Yeah. Eric. Good work. Thank you, Thank you. All right. We'll see everybody soon. <clears throat> um, what, Bryn, you did a terrific job on draft 2.2, and I especially like the green. 
<laughs> Maybe you want to share this draft for us to go over it this morning? Yes. Um, while Bryn is sharing the screen, tomorrow morning I'm taking my wife to a doctor's appointment. So I'll be by phone, but Senator Baruth, if you could um, run the meeting sure. on the robocalls. Um, I haven't found anybody that's in favor of them yet, but we might hear from them. We'll probably get robocalls about them. Probably. I'll be on the phone, so they won't be able to send me a robocall. <laughs> but um, I'll do my best to be involved um, while I'm at the doctor's office. My wife and mom taking her there. Uh, so, Peggy, if you could send me the Zoom information. Um, well, you will send me the Zoom information right, tomorrow. Yes, I will. And you can use any of those numbers that are included on it. Okay. Because I may dial in and do it by phone. I'll, I'll do my best to be involved, but obviously I can't chair the committee while I'm there. I should be back in time for the discussion of the. Um, data chart, data charges. Spoke like a Boston accent. Data. Um, purpose of probation uh, is uh, anything in green has changed from the last version of the bill. Yeah, so uh, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council, um, walking you through draft 2.2 of, of S45. And I just wanted to start out by saying that um, yesterday, you remember that the committee was taking some testimony on this bill, and I think that you had thought you were going to return to it. So um, I quickly did a new draft and sent it out to the witnesses um, around 1130 yesterday, and that was draft 2.1. So they may have reviewed that version. This okay. 2.2 is really substantively the same as that one. I, I only changed a few things. So um, if, if the witness, so that's just for the for the witnesses edification. Okay. <clears throat> so um, so there's the purpose of probation. Yep, so we added a new statute to the probation chapter in Title 28 that sets out the purpose of probation as being rehabilitative um, and reducing the risk that uh, offenders will commit another offense and protecting the safety of the victim and of the community. Um, I have not heard back from any witnesses on, on the draft, so they, they um, I wasn't able to incorporate any comments, so I imagine they will share with you their thoughts when they testify. I'm just curious if, if after the word and it should be thereby, something like that, thereby protecting the safety of the victim and the community instead of of the community and the community. Yep. I'll, I'll let, it just seems to flow a little better. Okay, I'll make that note. That okay with everybody? Mm -hmm. Okay, the um, line seventeen. So then, this uh, change was made at the request of the department. Um, just to clarify, this section it's not the recommendation of the commissioner, but it's the commissioner's motion to discharge. And then we've changed commissioner to prosecutor here. Um, it's the prosecutor who would file the motion to continue probation, not the department. And then I've changed this, I've narrowed it down here um, to preponderance of the evidence. Um, I thought that I heard some witnesses coalescing around that um, standard with the narrowed did. list of crimes. So I've put yep. it in here, um, but again, it's in green. So it's flagged if you wanna return to a different standard of proof. Then I move down to page two. So these are the findings that um, the court has to make in order to um, in order to grant a uh, motion of the prosecutor to continue probation. So B, you remember, is what we've been sort of working on that language in B. And I gave a couple of options here. The first is that defendant hasn't completed any determinate period of rehabilitative or risk reduction services required as a condition of their probation or is not substantially in compliance with the conditions of probation. And this language matches um, the criteria that have to be met um, in the second section for the department to file a motion to discharge in the first place. So you'll see this language again later. Alternatively, um, I know there was quite a bit of discussion about um, 
the grounds on which a court may choose to continue the probation. Uh, I think you could also remove B um, since the department is already um, screening probationers for this criteria. Um, they're doing that up front. So if a probationer meets this criteria, um, then they'll go uh, to before the court. If they don't meet it, they won't wind up before the court um, in the first place. So Correct. I think you could remove that language. Yes. Um, could I? Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Go ahead, Senator Baruth and then Senator White. So I'm, I'm, I think I see what the language is trying to do. I, I think, I think there's a little ambiguity, but maybe I'm reading it wrong. So when you say any determinate period of rehabilitative or risk reduction services, you mean uh, a programming requirement that has a determinant length. Correct. So, so it's a six month um, program, but what it says is has not completed any determinate period of the services. So if it's a six month thing and I've completed three months, mm -hmm. that is a determinate period. It's just not the complete program. <clears throat> you know what I mean? So I, I think the, the language is, is a little muddy in that way. It could, it could say something like defendant has not completed um, any determinate, has not completed a determinate program of rehabilitative or risk reduction services. Does that make sense? Yep. I, I think that kind of was my same question, but my question still is here of how do we, or maybe we addressed it somewhere else. If, if you are told that you have to have a six, in Philip's case, a six month um, program, but the program doesn't start until a month before your potential hearing. How do, how do we deal with that to make sure that people have access to programming while they're there? Because I've heard that they often don't start the programming until the end of, toward the end of the, the minimum sentence. Does that make any sense to anybody? Well, except that these are people on probation. Oh, these the are same, people on, okay, right. got it, yeah. So, but the same problem might exist that yeah. if you have class A is already in session and you might have to wait two months to get into class B because you, you know. Right, yeah. It has nothing to do with any of your behavior. You're just waiting to get into the, <clears throat> into whatever the treatment is that lasts three months. You could be, um, past your midpoint through no right. fault of your own. So how do we deal with that at all? Well, that's a good question. As, especially in some cases, um, I'm not sure this is true everywhere, but my guess is that in some places in the state, certain programs may not be available um, on a regular basis and may only come up a couple times a year. Yeah, a crash would be one. Mm -hmm. I think. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, is there anybody who would like to comment on this requirement who's in the room? Again, I can't see who's in the room. And so, Matt? Yes, thank you. Um, this was the area, one of the areas that I was talking about the last time I, I talked about this. And I know we're trying to, we're trying to do something to address the way programming <coughs> is handled. Um, but I do think you have a vagueness or a loophole kind of issue going on with determine, uh, sub C has completed any determinate period of rehabilitative or risk reduction services required as a condition of probation and is substantially in compliance with the remaining conditions. Because um, I, I don't see though that's not normal language. That's not something that we're familiar with. Um, you know, we, we're 
I don't, I don't, I don't know what to tell people what a determinate period of rehabilitative risk or reduction services means. Um, I can guess, but it's, this isn't something that we've ever described in statute before. And um, so when you try to put people on notice of what this means, it's very, it's not easy. I, I honestly, I don't know what I don't know what to say beyond that. I mean, I know you're uh, trying to get at there's domestic violence counseling. There's some let's social. take crash for an example, right? And you have to complete the crash program to get off probation, and the program started in. September, but you weren't convicted until October, and now you have to wait till December to get in. Right. How would that work in this, with this language? That's my question. <coughs> Is that, I think I'm getting hung up on the words determinate period. That, that's where the problem lies. Because huh? it's not really the time frame, it's the thing. Right. Yeah. So I, I think we need to remove this. I don't, I think it would complicate. I think it's covered elsewhere, frankly. Uh, this is Judge Grierson. Yep. Uh, for the record, uh, Brian Grierson, Chief Superior Judge. I, I would agree with Matt. That lang the first part of that language, or the first part of that paragraph, again, is not terminology that the court uses. Um, but I would think that by the, just the second clause is not in, is not substantially in compliance with conditions of probation would yeah. cover uh, th this area um, because it, it would apply to basically any conditions. Um, I agree and with that. The situation you described, I don't think it's uncommon if someone has a condition of probation uh, that they haven't met, that the condition, I mean, the uh, probation can be extended uh, for a period of time to allow them to complete a condition. So we read A, termination and discharge will present a risk of danger to the victim of the offense or to the community, or B, is not substantially in compliance with the conditions of probation. Is that that's, how I would read that? That's my suggestion. I'm good with that. Mitty? Sounds good. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. Okay. <laughs> Next is... Um, <clears throat> Right, so subdivision two, this is just changing again the word um, commissioner to prosecutor here. So if the court grants the prosecutor's motion to continue probation, um, it has the option to continue for the full term or a, a portion of that term. And then the new sentence there, the court shall also review the conditions of probation and remove any conditions that are not necessary for the remainder of the term. <clears throat> that was discussed yesterday. Yep. Okay, I'm gonna move down to section two where we get into the requirement that the department do the midpoint review. So again, um, we're on, now we're on page six. Right. I um, didn't hear definitively that the, that the committee wanted to do this, but um, I made this change that now subdivision B, one of the criteria for the department recommending a person for discharge is that the person is not serving a sentence for committing um, a domestic assault or a stalking offense or a sexual assault offense or an LNL with a child. So we've um, narrowed the number of crimes that are excluded. And then C, oops, sorry. <clears throat> you see this language again. Um, about determinate period of rehabilitative or risk reduction services. So um, we, you may want to remove that here Can you go well. over again the, the, um, the non-qualifying crimes, domestic assault, stalking, 
LNL with a child, and was there another one there? And sex assault, any of the sexual assault offenses. You, thank you. You're on C on line 16. Yep. So we took out the highlighted um, underline and struck through language here was that indeterminate period of programming to the satisfaction of the probation officer. I removed that. It sounded like nobody liked that language. Um, but again, we've left, the, I've, this is this language about a determinate period is still here. Um, again, this is the commissioners. This is what the department is reviewing. Um, so I don't know if you want to leave it here for the department to review whether or not the person has completed any um, defined amount of this type of programming or not, um, or if you want to narrow this down to um, ensuring that the person is substantially in compliance with their conditions. Yes. Now, Dale, do you want to comment? Um, I would agree that the determinate period of rehabilitative uh, services is not really clear so i'm not really sure what how we would want to play that um as far as the department requirement um my concern is that if you only go to substantial compliance that the offenders will not have had the opportunity that doesn't mean completing of the program so i guess the question the policy question is um and i'll give two examples one would be substance abuse treatment and then one would be like a batteries intervention program. Substance abuse treatments, there's not really a set number of sessions to complete per se. It's based on the progress of the offender. Um, and the, the BEP, the batteries intervention program for domestic violence, there's a set number of classes to successfully complete. So I guess the question would be, um, what level of completing of the risk reduction services um, is going to be the policy decision. Do you want individuals to complete their risk reduction services? Do you want it? Um, so, so that would be, so we have to make the determination if someone's in substantially compliant, they could be in a sex offender program and they could be going and doing what they needed to be do, but they haven't reduced their risk as of yet. So that, that's kind of where the language, how you want to word that language. I don't really have recommendations um, you know, we did have, it was taken out here, but to the satisfaction of the probation officer, because that would leave them the ability to make those determinations. Uh, but if you want to restrict the discretion of the department, um, that, that does it. And it, but, but the language needs to be clear, kind of what, what you want as far as a policy decision. Well, if he or she has completed rehabilitative or risk reduction services, required as condition of probation is substantially in compliance with the remaining conditions. If you took out the terminate period, I don't, that would help me. Um, mm -hmm. I would agree. Senate what? Vermont, Senate Judiciary Committee schedule for today. What? Sorry. Sorry, sorry I'm trying to get this thing on my phone. Oh. So, so can I ask a question about that? So mm -hmm. if we, if you said has completed um, the rehabilitative, is that what you're suggesting is just taking out? I'm saying taking period? out the words, any determinate period. Of. Right. So if you has completed rehabilitative services, um, I would think that people with substance abuse issues, that goes on forever and ever. It isn't, you don't complete that. Well, uh, no, it's whatever was required in the conditions of probation. It wouldn't require, they might require, let's take the DUI. You're required to go through crash. Right. You've completed that. You've been through it. Or anger management, there's five sessions of anger management. You went through it. You've completed it. Doesn't mean that you've successfully completed it, unsuccessfully completed it, you went to the things. Um, right, but what if it says uh, work with folk rehab to work toward finding a job or work with Vermont Adult Learning to complete uh, a degree those, or those usually counseling? 
They aren't, con well, I don't know. They're conditions. Dale, do we have those open conditions? Yeah. I mean, it's, yes. it, you can, any anything that, that is on a, an agreement, it could be pretty wide open. Yep. I think that it should just be substantially is in, con uh, I can hardly read it, but in compliance with the conditions of probation. Oh, thank you, Bryn. Thank you. Senator, if I might, David Chair. Yeah, David, Chair. please. Yep. Um, a couple thoughts. One is I actually, you know, when we're thinking about this bill, this is a, as a whole, it's sort of a two-step process that we're creating. And the, the, this is actually the first step, even though it comes second in the, uh, in the text, uh, comes below the court piece, but the court piece is second, this is first. And I think it's uh, in order to ensure that uh, we're getting as many of these discharge recommendations as possible to up to the court, I think it's really important that we try to make this D1 uh, a series of on-off, uh, and not just that we're getting as many, but that there's an equal opportunity across the state. Uh, we want to make these conditions as much an on-off switch as we possibly can, uh, where there's very little judgment as to whether the switch is on or the switch is off. Um, and so when the switch is on, bam, it goes up to the court. And then if there's a question about victim safety or substantial compliance, the court can adjudicate that with, with input from prosecutors and, and uh, defendants. But I think here, what would make sense, and I'm not sure if I have the phrasing right, but um, I, I'm sure I don't have the phrasing right, but my recommendation would be to have something like um, programming, uh, you know, can, let me explain the concept and then perhaps we yep. can, somebody else can work on the wording, having a little trouble with that. But I think the idea is that for this sub C, conditions have to be completed where the program at the outset has a set term. So in other words, not like substance use treatment, which go, could go on forever, not finding a job, which could take a long time, but something like Project Crash, which has a set term and you know it's an on off switch. Somebody's done it or they haven't done it and that's it. Um, but for all the programming where it could go on, it could go on at the judgment of the um, person administering the program, it could go on to the satisfaction of the probation officer, all that stuff should not, judgments about the substantial completion, I believe should not be in D1 because the step that's within the department should basically be in as much as we can possibly create it, be an on off switch. All right, the, the person's hit it, Let's hit these switches. Let's send it to court. If there's issues about victim safety or substantial compliance with other conditions that have to do with rehabilitation, like um, substance use treatment stuff that's ongoing or job finding jobs that's ongoing, the prosecutor will have a chance in court to say, well, we'd actually, I know this got sent up because it hit the switches in D1, but we actually think there should there needs to be a bit more work here. So that would be my recommendation is the rubric for how we look at D1 should be, is it very easy to know that it's been done or not done? And so that would be my recommendation. And then I think we can leave it to that court process to sort of do a little cleanup where needed. I think Senator Sears stepped away. I, I don't know what uh, somebody else may have to take over. Okay, happy to do that. Any uh, more questions about this section? This isn't necessarily a question about this section. I'm just curious if when, when this um, happens, when this mid review happens, is the offender notified that it's happening and um, do they have a chance to to speak to it if if the I mean DOC sends it to the state's attorney is that right and then the state's attorney decides um, does the offender have any idea that it's happening or not happening? We would be discussing it with the offender. 
I mean, that's, that's going to be one of the incentives uh, that the probation officer uses in order to motivate the probationer to complete the conditions in order to get off supervision. And is that what happens now? Yeah. If, if, if there, it's an internal review. So um, usually part of the intake, it, it understands what's going on with, with probation. But if the offender is not in compliance, um, the offender generally knows they're not in compliance, and then we wouldn't be filing the discharge, the motion for discharge now. Okay, thanks. Bryn? Mm. Okay, I'm going to keep going then. Okay. So I'm going to scroll down here to the next page. You'll see all of this um, old language is or existing language is struck through. What, what I've done there is the, removed that requirement that was in the former subdivision two that required the department to file a motion to reduce the term of probation if they didn't file a motion to discharge. And instead in this new subdivision two, we've changed this language to require that the department file for discharge once the probationer meets all of those criteria that you've set forth in D1. Um, so again, referring back to that A, B and C um, in subdivision one. <clears throat> so again, whatever, whatever um, you do in D1 will affect what happens here as well. Subdivision four, whoopsie. We've just removed this language about um, the commissioner adopting a rule. That really is existing statutory language. It's underlined here because I moved it around. So essentially that will be language that's repealed. Um, but as the department testified, because the, the statutory language here is so uh, directive, they, they sounds like they don't need a rule to effectuate it. And then we've changed the directive here about victim notification to require the prosecutor um, to make that notification, which I believe is current practice. Uh, Bryn? Yep. Quick question. Good faith effort, is that currently the, the language? So good, good faith effort um, I was, I believe, requested um, by a couple of the witnesses that you were talking about um, last week. I don't know mm -hmm. if you wanted to, the committee wants to put in more um, specific language about what good faith effort means. Um, you do that in some areas of the law and in some you do not. It, it seems a pretty loosey goosey um, term. Uh, because good faith is always in the eyes of the beholder. Um, Senator Sears? No. Um, just wondering about uh, your thoughts on good faith effort to notify victims. Yeah, Pretty I weak. agree. It's Chris, Chris Fano had testified that it was too weak. You yeah, can't I, make it. You can't make it a direct connection that they actually make connection with the victim, though, because years go by and the victims could be anywhere, and they may not be able to locate them. So that's why I think this good faith effort uh, is there for that reason. Okay, um, Bryn, who would who would adjudicate if there was a dispute about the good faith effort? Who who would? Would that be the court? I am not sure. I imagine that um, I imagine that the prosecutor could argue. Um, I, I'm not sure about that. Okay. I think Maybe if I can jump in, uh, Senator oh, Bruce. Please, Judge Bruce. I, I would expect that when it, there is a request for discharge and the state is opposing it. Um, the court would would make inquiry um, of of the prosecutor uh, what the what the victim's uh, position is on this, um, and and I, and I would agree with what Senator Benning had to say. You know, th this could be some time um, after the the original sentencing. Uh, they may not have uh, contact. Uh, with the victim, um, but at, ultimately, w whatever attempts have been made, I mean, we have to go forward with the 
with the proceedings. So some folks may wish it was a, a stronger wording, but I think good faith effort covers what what we would expect the prosecutor to do. I mean, we would expect an explanation mm -hmm. if, yeah. I mean, presumably if the prosecutor is opposed to the discharge, um, they would have had some contact with the, with the victim. Maybe that's a wrong assumption on my part. In other words, I think you'd be more concerned if the state was not opposing a discharge um, mm -hmm. in this case. So I, I think the language meets uh, would meet the obligation yeah. um there are cases where the if the prosecutor tried to reach the victim and they don't have a phone number they don't have an address anymore the victim has moved um you know some of these cases are you know people are fairly transient and uh, so I, I think i i think i'm all right with that is there something Matt, did you want to comment? Yeah, I, I mean, I was going to say that this could be months or even years after the, the case resolved, and there may have been no contact with the victim, with the probation or the courts or anybody. Um, so I, I think good faith effort is as, as good as you can do um, under the circumstances, because if it had required actual notice or anything, you'd be spending a lot of effort trying to track people down who maybe really don't want to have anything to do with it anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I think sometimes yeah. people have moved on. Um, one of the problems I know the corrections department has is people don't notify the corrections department that they want information. <clears throat> so I, when somebody's released or something, for example, uh, on furlough, I know there was problems with who, oh, I didn't get notified. Well, they never asked to be notified. I, I could uh, just mention one thing if it's helpful. Yeah. Uh, this is James Pepper from the Department of State Attorneys and Sheriffs. <clears throat> there is a similar standard in the expungement statutes. Um, it's uh, 13 BSA 7608 related to victim notification prior to um, agreeing to an expungement, which says that uh, the prosecutor's office shall make reasonable efforts, um, but that those efforts shall not um, be a bar to granting the petition. And then it defines reasonable efforts as sending first class mail to the last known address and making a telephone call to the last known number. So there could be a cross reference to that or just a, a copy and paste and into well, this. Suppose, yeah. Yeah, you could do that. I guess. That sounds good to me. Sounds good to me. Seems a little. Yeah, it's already in law. Yeah, sounds like a good idea then. It's a little bit stronger, so. You would support that as a prosecutor. That's what we're doing anyway um, for for the midpoint review. Um, so yes, that, that seems reasonable. So if, to if the judge said, what, what, what does the victim think you would report? We tried to contact the victim, the last known address, at the last known phone number, um, et cetera. Right. Is that okay, Bryn? Have you got that? Yep. Okay. Moving right along to page eight. So the last change is that we've added a section here directing the Sentencing Commission um, to take a look at the probation statute and the Pew Charitable Trusts study that was referred to in, in committee yesterday and consider whether Vermont should limit the duration of probation terms for misdemeanors to two years and then report back to the Justice Oversight Committee um, by October of this year. Did everybody get this report? Did we post it or how did I end up with it? No, I mean, maybe we did it. Hold it up again. I got a, a great big couple reports. Is it this one? Oh, you, you can't see me. Oh, oh. Yeah, I, it's not that one. This is from Pew Charitable Trusts. 
Yeah, I think so. And it looks at states, it's entitled States Consumer oh, yeah. Information and Protect Public Safety. Yeah, too well done. Yeah. Cool. Well, I looked at um, page 18. Many states cap probation for misdemeanors at two years, and we're actually an outlier with no maximum. You know, we're, I think we're better than we used to be. I, I remember when I was first in the legislature for some reason, I don't know how this came up, but there was a, a sentencing committee and uh, somebody named Zaccaro maybe was on there. Yep. And yep. Um, the Zaccaro they, let, they let me come in and testify. I remember going up to the governor's office because we had our probation at the time and I'm not sure it was all of them, but some of them said, you're on probation until you can be good. <laughs> and I said, oh, wow. who, who on earth can be good always? And I, I just, so I think we're better than we used to be. Agreed. Oh, I, we've come a long way. The Zaccaro Commission was on, oh. on, that's the one that recommended that we build no new prisons, but if we were going to build one, it should be a detention. It should be what? A detention facility. Oh. I believe Con Hogan, um, Zaccaro, they were appointed by Douglas. I can't think of the Was it Ginsburg? I don't remember. There were three or four all men, of course, in the room when I went to testify. Yep. Ginsburg, I'd understand, but Ed Zuccaro said that? He was the chair. Wow. <laughs> yeah, he was the chair of the Zuccaro Commission. It was a, mm -hmm. a Douglas appointed commission, I believe, to look at prison yep. issues. It was well, some I'm, event that occurred, and I can't remember which one it was. Do you remember, Matt? Yeah, I mean, I, I know that that was the one you were you were talking about. That that happened during the Douglas administration for sure. It was maybe like two thousand four or five or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I was first in the legislature. Actually, I've still got that report sitting on the top of the file cabinet in Senate Judiciary. <laughs> 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 not, not anymore. Not it's in a box somewhere. Nothing's oh, well, out. <laughs> nothing's out. Okay. Well, yeah. it was sitting on the top of the where the computer is, not Peggy's, but the the uh, MIDI computer right there on the top there. Yeah. Everything's gone. Everything's I tried to gone. find my. I tried to find my 1974. Um, law enforcement study that was on the top of the filing cabinet when I went up there and it's gone somewhere. Well, whenever, we go, whenever we get the opportunity to go back to Montpelier, I'm sure we'll have a field day trying to find all the things I knew <laughs> right where it was. It's sort of like, I don't know. I hope they haven't cleaned out Alice's vault. No, they haven't. <laughs> they don't have the combination. <laughs> Is the fluff the still there? Gone. Yeah, the fluffer nutter is gone. Fluff oh, no. Gone. That's gone. I threw that out. The day oh, we... I, I got a jar of fluff here. <laughs> okay. All right. I think we pick up with this on Thursday. Can we do a final draft? Or hopefully get something out to people before Thursday, Bryn? Yep, sure thing. So I was that looking be at next week's agenda and I believe it was yeah. 8.30 to 10.15 so if we plan for 8.30 um, on this on Thursday the 18th um, if you can get things out to all the witnesses and the committee members mm -hmm. and all, um, and Nick are you going to start meeting on eight at 8.30 on Thursdays? Yeah, uh, no, just that one Thursday, because that's the day we have the stupid election the trustees at UVM and State Agriculture College. Okay. And so it's eating up the entire morning, most of the morning, and I wanted to get two hours in. So 
Okay, the other one is eating up afternoon committees. <laughs> yeah, well, that's also ridiculous. I don't mean the the inspector, the adjutant the inspector general and, and sergeant of arms are not ridiculous. It's us putting trustees on UVM's board. Senator Hardy and I agree that it's a bad idea. She's taken over with Senator Ash. It, it is not a bad idea. Well, we'll debate it when the bill comes up on the floor from the education committee. They're gonna remove the public trustees? Well, I, I, I don't know that that's a done deal to come out of the education committee. Oh, okay. Well, I um, guess we, I'll have to put pressure on Campion. <laughs> I will, I will tell you that I believe the election of the adjutant general is ridiculous. Okay. We well, you can change that, that. We did. We passed it last year, and the House. Well, it's very complicated, and. Uh, I bet I voted for it. You did? Wagons, wagons. Wagons over exactly. there. Exactly. Join me in my constitutional amendment to cut it to 75. <laughs> Can't we do it by administrative rule? <laughs> no, it's in the constitution. Executive order. <laughs> <laughs> well, the other way that we could do it is reduce the budget so we only pay for 75. <laughs> you have 150 but pay for 75? Yeah. Oh. And they'd have to choose who gets paid and who doesn't. Foolproof. It is. <laughs> All those on the budget committee <laughs> say aye. I'm sure we could get it past the Senate. 